All right, let's start the afternoon rolling. And it is a great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Matt Kahn. Um, I don't know that there is anyone more prolific on the subject of climate change, resilience, and urban economics. Yeah, I think that's, I don't think there's anyone more prolific. Uh, Matt has been here at USC for about 10, 11 years, something like that. Uh, before that, he was at the institution down the 10 from us, which I, I actually, my wife is a professor there, so I love that institution too. Um, a PhD from the University of Chicago, as if I, if I don't say that, he certainly will. Um, and a great object lesson in civil behavior, because uh, you know we were talking about polarization this morning. And I know Pat, uh, Pat, I don't know where that came from, Matt disagrees with me all the time, and yet he always treats me splendidly well. So um, Matt Kahn, thanks so much for being here. Richard, thank you. Folks, it's great to see everyone. I am going to give a brief and hopefully fun and interesting talk. Uh, I'm a microeconomist. Does everyone remember their supply and demand? And I want to briefly talk to you about a book that didn't sell. Uh, I want to talk to you about my book, Adapting to Climate Change. I'm going to give my friend Dan Cashton a copy. And uh, it's a side copy, so maybe take this and pass it back. Dan is already sleeping in back. Hey, <laughs> folks, what I want to talk about, I want to talk for about 25 minutes. I want to be interesting. I want to be alive. And then I want to hear, I want to interact with you. I already know this stuff. I want to hear what you think. Folks, we're not going to be talking about carbon footprints. I'm not going to ask you what, whether you had beef for lunch or how long you shower for. We can talk about low carbon buildings. We can talk about LEED. We can talk about Energy Star. I've published papers on this stuff. What I want to talk to you about for 25 minutes is the adaptation challenge. Folks, think of Phoenix in the year 2040. Are any of you thinking of investing in property there? I'm looking around. The New York Times on a daily basis is telling us about drought, heat of 130 degrees. Is If you're thinking of investing in Phoenix real estate in the medium term, is this an opportunity or is this a challenge? If we know that there's known unknowns about the challenges we face, what do prudent people do in their investment patterns? That's what I want to talk about. And along the way, I'm going to address the three questions that I said I was going to talk about. City competition for footloose people and investment, migration out of cities that fail to adapt to the very serious challenges we face. And so if I had a tattoo, it would say, I am so afraid of climate change that this bolsters my optimism that we can adapt to many of its challenges. That when you face a clear and present danger, what do prudent people do to protect themselves, their families, their investments, and their livelihoods? That's what I want to speak to you about. I'm the bad boy in the environmental movement because I greatly fear climate change, which makes some of my friends um, uncomfortable. But I'm also a huge fan of free markets. And that makes other of my friends uncomfortable. So I, I live my life in no man's land. And I hope this is a safe space. I'm looking around. Oh, tough room. So here's where I want to start. We have to adapt because greenhouse gas emissions are going to continue to rise. I'm going to come back at the end and talk about adaptation and mitigation, the, the synergistic benefits. And I am a fan of President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. But as the developing world grows richer and as world population grows, there's going to be more greenhouse gas emissions. We have unleashed the genie. We have to adapt. For prudent investors in this room, what challenges and what opportunities does this create? When I think, and I'm a very simple person, very simple person, Mother Nature is punching us harder and harder. Are we passive victims? Or a little bit like Rocky Balboa, when do you duck, when do you box and weave? Tough room. Of what steps do we take to protect our assets and our families? Folks, as an optimist, the first empirical paper that I wrote on adapting to climate change was on the death toll from natural disasters. 
Every natural disaster is a horror and causes damage. But in my first paper, The Death Toll from Natural Disasters, I documented that in richer countries, fewer people die in natural disasters. Because of information technology, we're getting better and better at getting the word out about tsunamis and other emerging crises. And we're protecting ourselves at high pace when such disasters occur. Another example of the new freakonomics of climate change adaptation. So that was example number one. I'm very interested, as Mother Nature is punching us harder, does that cause more or less damage? That's what I want you guys thinking about. Folks, there was recently a fascinating paper called Heat and Learning. Did anyone read Josh Goodman and co-authors Pace, Heat and Learning? So here's what these guys did. They, they acquired data. Does everyone remember the SATs and the joys of taking the standardized SAT test? Oh, tough room. They got. They, they, I don't see it. And I, I'm feeling it already. <laughs> Folks, they collected data on millions of American teenagers' scores on the SATs, and they. And so, if 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 I was a young person in Baltimore taking the exam in 2015, they coded up how hot was my, my local area in Baltimore in the three previous years, and they documented that if I studied at a high school that didn't have air conditioning, where there was extreme heat. I actually learned less based on my lower SAT score. Folks, is that cool? So this is the Freakonomics. So to say this again, and I know I'm talking fast and you're digesting lunch, economists in the Steve Levitt Freakonomics tradition are looking for interesting measures of how extreme climate affects us. These brilliant scholars documented that if you go to a, a public high school that doesn't have central air conditioning, because it's getting so hot in April, May, September, and October, young people are learning less in the classroom. And if you introduce air conditioning in a Baltimore, and Baltimore is investing in air conditioning using federal money, and it's aware that there's this learning loss because of heat. And the government is making strategic investments to offset those losses. So that's an example of economists as detectives detecting these funky, unintended consequences of climate change manifesting itself and thinking through what are we losing, what are young people losing, and what can we do to offset these losses. So folks, in this, um, I'm going to skip this point. In, in my own work, has anyone read a recent paper by me? Richard, Richard and I wrote a paper recently. So folks, what we did was we used lights at night. Satellites are always flying overhead. And we looked when major floods occur in a Pakistan in the United States, how much do lights at night dim and how quickly do they recover? This was our benchmark indicator of when Mother Nature throws a shock, a flood. How much damage does it do using the thermometer lights at night? And then how quickly does the area recover? Poorer places suffer more from the shock and recover slower. I'm always trying to come up with these empirical measures. So now I want to start my talk and begin to wrap up. I am partnering. What's going on at USC and every major university is that social scientists and climate scientists are working together on these interdisciplinary models that I believe should inform your investment patterns. So companies like Jupiter, how many of you have heard of the company Jupiter? How many of you have heard of First Street Foundation? So could you bring up the slide on First Street Foundation? So this is my one slide, so you stop looking at my bald head. So folks, First Street Foundation, and I'm a researcher there. This is a nonprofit. I don't get paid by these guys. Matthew Ebby, the president, Jeremy Porter, their, their research officer. What First Street Foundation is doing, and they were in the New York Times yesterday, is for every address, you can type in an address. You have to pay for commercial properties, but you can type in any residential address. And what these men and women, what they are doing is creating a four-dimensional prediction model for every property, for every address in the United States. And I've asked these guys, can you do this in Egypt? And they said, we need a million bucks. I said, we can start a GoFundMe. But uh, we're going to see this in the developing world. In the United States already, these climate scientists are they're using climate science models, which is both an art and a science, to predict for every property flood risk, fire risk, a heat exposure, and, and, and I'm forgetting one of the dimensions of these sort of plagues. And this is very useful information. Folks, don't take these point estimates as the truth. But do you see how this informs decision making by people in the room? As the New York Times on a daily basis talks about the challenges we face, 
more and more of us are aware of the challenges we face. And I'm gonna come back to red states in a moment and tell you about a new paper of mine in a couple of minutes. What climate science is doing here is playing the role of Paul Revere. Of course there's uncertainty of the extent of the flooding risk, of the timing of the flooding risk, but no one in this room could say that you didn't know. There are known unknowns. And when you face known unknowns, different bettors are gonna make different bets. If you're very risk averse in your portfolio, you may not invest in certain REITs that face uh, flood risk. While for others looking for more risk, this might be a tremendous opportunity. So the first point I want you thinking about is that climate science is playing this role of Paul Revere giving investors a heads up about emerging risks. I don't wanna hear about behavioral finance that you didn't know. It's getting cheaper and cheaper to learn the risks out there and informed investors with a medium term horizon are gonna think this through. What I love about what these guys are doing, and there is a fight over the precision of their estimates, is this is really geographically refined. So, uh, you, so within the same zip code, you, there can be different flood scores depending on the topography of the asset. And so this isn't, th th these in, First Street is claiming to have real geographic resolution. And they are selling these to many entities, including the Treasury Department, uh, as, as more and more institutions are incorporating these data, including Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, so I think we're done with that slide. I want to bring back attention to me. Folks, an idea from the efficient markets hypothesis is that the price of an asset should equal the expected present discounted value of its rental stream. If there's something wonderful, if there's a real estate investment in Phoenix right now that it's wonderful, but in 30, if in 20 years it's common knowledge that it will be destroyed by high heat, then it, on some level the, the, that asset should reflect that expectation now. And so I'm fascinated to learn from you whether you believe the efficient markets hypothesis of markets incorporating th these expectations or how many behavioralists we have in the room. And, if, and are, is there money to be made off of behavioral agents if, if people are overly optimistic? So guys, do you know that joke that's out on the internet where uh, people say that uh, red state investors will purchase all coastal m it properties saying that flood risk is low and then when a day of reckoning occurs, they will lose out on their bet. Th that's an interesting hypothesis. I actually don't believe that that's true. What if they think that on the day of reckoning, Washington is going to bail them out? Very fair. And so, and very, so it's and, very rational. And, and very fair. And in the book that Dan is inheriting, I discussed that at length. So folks, in a world, so actually let's spend a minute on that. It's much more interesting than this. So Moral hazard has been discussed in the financial crisis. Moral hazard in climate change is gonna become a major issue. So Patrick Bayless and Judd Boomhauer had a paper that in the American West, there's free firefighting provided for people in fire zones. If for people in fire zones, they're getting subsidized insurance. I wanna live in a free market where you're free to take a risk but you pay your own bills for taking that risk. If I live in a safe place, I don't wanna be subsidizing your fire insurance and, and your potential bailouts if a day of reckoning occurs. And so there's very interesting libertarian issues of this moral hazard effect that we're currently subsidizing risk taking by subsidizing water prices in places with drought, in subsidizing insurance in fire zones. And so these issues are gonna to come to the head going forward and I'd be happy to talk about this. So I already mentioned that for every asset that you have invested in, I strongly recommend doing a diagnostic workout. Where are your assets? And overlaying your assets on First Street Foundation and Jupiter's maps so that you can see your risk exposure. Folks, suppose that some of your assets, whether they're hotels, commercial properties, uh, if you own shares in a, a, a large amount of REITs, suppose that you do have exposure to a specific risk, whether it's PM 2.5 spikes, flood risk, fire risk. Are you going to be a passive victim there? Uh, there's a question of what can be done to offset that risk. Something very exciting at these universities is young people are always training in their careers. And if it's the case that there's a growing demand for flood protection or fire protection, we're going to get more and more innovation in that sector. So folks, you should notice that I'm a bald man. If I were the world's only bald man, do we get Rogaine? Thank you. In every room of 100, I have one fan. We, so uh, what fascinates me as a free market guy is if enough people have a problem, 
entrepreneurs step up and raise their game to solve the problem. So the valley of death is if just a few people have a problem, and we've run into this with vaccine issues in the developing world, if enough people have a problem, that creates enough aggregate demand for entrepreneurs to enter, not out of altruism, to be the next Musk and Bezos. And so this is another free market debate I'm having with folks, that the recognition that we face problems going forward and that successful people are willing to pay for solutions creates a market and through the competition that will unfold, that somebody will succeed and will have this induced innovation that helps us to adapt in the coming decades. For example, we see in Israel water salinization to increase water supply there. And there's just dozens of these engineering examples, even without a government subsidy. Uh, what we, and I'll come back at the end for what we need from government. Let's go back to you. You face assets at risk, and you face a known unknown of climate change. How much flooding will Miami face by 2040? How hot will Phoenix be in 2030? Is there any safer, higher ground? Should you be investing in Maine? Should you be investing in Minnesota? I think there's very interesting spatial portfolio issues of where, where is higher ground? How risk averse are we? A, Think of a Phoenix. If Phoenix is 130 degrees for some months, do we just do what we do in the Middle East and we're air conditioned all the time? Or with the rise of work from home, does Phoenix empty out during the summertime? And people are just there eight months a year. And then when it's truly uninhabitable, people just vacate for a while in a work from home economy. So I'm always thinking through without bordering on science fiction, how do we reorder society when we face a challenge and when we have an ever growing menu of strategies to cope with what we've collectively unleashed, climate change. Now I wanna make a point about type one and type two errors. Uh, folks, type one and type two errors. So in a court, we feel bad about executing an innocent man. And we think that that's worse than releasing a, a, a guilty man. Does everyone see that those are two errors? So Santa Claus knows who's naughty and nice. We want to convict guilty people and we want to release innocent people. A type one error is to execute an innocent man and a type two error is, is to release a guilty man. In the case of climate change, it will interest me for each of you as investors. Are you going to play it really safe? Uh, so if you own a hotel in Miami, are you going to ask that it be elevated, even though that's costly and may ex post, it might prove to not be at such risk? Or are you going to take a gamble and say, hey, maybe the government will bail us out. Maybe these progressives are overestimating this challenge and just take the gamble of doing nothing. And so I'm going to be very interested who buys which assets and which climate proofing strategies do different investors take to protect those assets. And I claim due to innovation that the marginal cost of protecting assets is going to get cheaper and cheaper. That's what engineers do. Folks, I've just had the opportunity to work with Redfin and First Street Foundation on the following project. How many of you have been to the Redfin website? It's a Zillow competitor for buying a house. So Millions of Americans, unbeknownst to them, were part of an experiment in, in, in 2019. Uh, First Street Foundation, for free, started to pre present to them the flood score for the homes they were looking at. And we, so we observed whether people were looking at flood risky homes, unbeknownst to them. Uh, so let's do this again. So if Matthew was randomly assigned to the treatment group, and if I entered the experiment on November 18th, 2019, any homes that I looked at before November 18th, I didn't know their flood scores. After November 18th, I see the usual Zillow Redfin information about the homes, the price of the home, how many bedrooms and bathrooms it has, and I now also see its flood score. Folks, we document, I want to make two points because there's several things I want to say. We document that, every, that on average, people respond to this information and they look for safer homes in the same zip code, and they make choices to substitute away from risky products. Folks, we then had a clever thought. One hypothesis which was false was the following. I said to my data team, guys, in areas that recently had a major hurricane, are people more responsive to this news? That's the salience hypothesis. We didn't find evidence of that. I said, guys, Let's look at some Trump counties, counties that voted for Trump in 2016 or 2020. Do we see these red state people ignoring this, this flood score stuff? No. We reject the hypothesis that in red, th there's no statistical difference in red states and blue states 
In both areas, people respond in private. This is not in voting markets. This is in private behavior. People respond to this flood risk information by looking for safer homes. There is a demand out there for these safe assets. If they, and if they bid for these homes, they bid less for these homes. They're more informed investors. Because you know, if, if, if an asset's at risk, but you can buy it for a dollar, that might be a great buy. And so we see this, this updating by individuals as they face this risk. Back to you. I want to make a point about option value. I would hope going forward, given the known unknowns about climate change, I would hope that the assets you invest in have option value. For example, if there is a hotel that is at risk, are there steps that can be taken at a cost to make it more resilient? So you can either spatially move your portfolio to physically safer areas, or you can take assets at risk and bolster them. But if the, if the option value concept is this ability ex post as we learn to make a costly investment to climate proof the asset. And I claim that assets with greater option value will be more valuable going forward because there's so much we need to learn. There's so much uncertainty about climate change. I want to make a point about expertise and incentives. So something that I, Richard and I have not discussed is at a major REIT. So if a REIT owns a bunch of buildings in Phoenix, and in different places, I would hope that they are hiring people with expertise in climate resilience going forward. That these will be key individuals going forward to help steward these assets given the risks that I've sketched out, given the known unknowns. And so I'm a believer that when there are incentives to develop expertise, and I came back to this a moment ago about undergraduates and graduate students training in this, we're gonna have more and more human capital in climate resilience. There's so much focus on reducing our carbon footprint, and I get it, but we will face climate change. The developing world is gonna get rich. India is gonna to begin to converge with China. China's gonna keep growing richer. Africa's growth has just begun. Because there's going to be more greenhouse gas emissions, we can't push the adaptation challenge aside. Folks, we live in an age of big data. There's more and more sensors to judge what risks we take. And so I think this is a very exciting time in data science. Two last points before I bring you in. People come up to me and say, Matt, I love your optimism, but you believe in magic. I say, no, I don't believe in magic. I believe in competition. Um, two adults in the room are the insurance industry and lenders. Going forward, let's do insurers first. As I talked about in my Climatopolis book and in this book, suppose that we deregulate the insurance industry. And you can read my 2017 Harvard Business School piece, which I wrote with two USC undergraduates. If you want to read some of my writing, uh, type in Matthew Kahn, Harvard Business Review 2017. If we deregulate the insurance industry and allow these folks to charge any price they want, we're going to see prices rise for insurance in risky places. This is going to nudge investors to higher ground into safer places if we get rid of these government subsidies for risk taking. The insurance industry can also write nonlinear contracts where they offer a discount for insurance if you take certain precautions, like clearing vegetation in a fire zone or elevating properties in a flood zone. The insurance industry can be the adult in the room, the mortgage lending industry. Folks, we've seen that some owners of real estate sometimes default on loans. Tough room. <laughs> if we worry going forward that climate change could lash out at a Phoenix and that somebody underwater where the price of their, the price of their, ho their property minus the, the debt is negative, banks can require lower loan to value ratios that you have more skin in the game and to charge you a higher interest rate in riskier places just like the insurance industry. And I've argued that a merger of the insurance industry with banks would really align these incentives such that real estate investors would be investing in climate safer places. And this is a discussion we can have offline of who is the adult in the room nudging decision makers, even if they're blissfully unaware of these risks, to take into account the risks we now face. The role of government. My vision for the role of government here is to have excellent satellites so that we have the best science in the world to measure the risks we face. I, I also have an imagination of local government changing our zoning codes as First Street Foundation identifies higher ground that we upzone in those places so that middle class and poor people can live in those areas to avoid the climate gentrification issue. I want electricity and water prices to reflect scarcity. Folks, why is there alfalfa grown in Arizona? 
that water could be sold to urbanites and no leader of Phoenix would be saying there can't be growth because there's no water. So, uh, so on my tombstone, it will say death to alfalfa in Arizona. A free market economist says that scarce assets, increasingly scarce because of climate change, should be allocated to the highest bidder. And that urban growth, we need urban growth. And that, that it, because of price distortions, we have alfalfa grown in the middle of drought company, country. And so a fascinating question to debate with the room is will we get the political reforms that a free market environmentalist asks for? And so I'm hugely optimistic about our ability to adapt to this challenge because professionals like you are engaging with this challenge. With undergraduates, I say, why did the Titanic sink? The Titanic didn't see the iceberg and had this hubris that the iceberg couldn't sink the ship. And I say to my students, no. And, and, and so, uh, so I'd ask you to think through that analogy. If you have a sufficient fear of the risk we face, and if you're aware of the risk that the risk could pose to you, you're not a passive victim. You step up and you take the set of steps individually that we talked about here, and in aggregate, that gets enough demand going to get our entrepreneurs hard at work to innovate. Richard, thank you. So if I understand everything you laid out there, and you're trying to find ways to send really effective price signals to the market so to force rational economic behavior to drive the change. So what do you think is going to be one of the thorniest externalities to ultimately be able to signal the market to, to cause impact? That's an excellent question. So in a Texas, suppose that Texas never has a governor who believes that climate change is a real threat. But suppose that he or she sees that Texas is losing population and is losing jobs. That loss is sufficient to begin to ask questions of what's going wrong in the entity. Uh, so that's a hypothesis that interests me. But I, your question's an excellent one. I want to hear more questions. Uh, I, I can go on, but I want to hear more. My question is a little more basic. Um, you seem to really love Phoenix. <laughs> is that the number one market that you're worried about right now? And second question, timing-wise, is there a particular market that first on the horizon you think is going to really have a major climate issue? I mean, again, you spoke about Phoenix a lot, so we'd just love to hear a little bit more. So there, I'm an economist. I'm not a climate scientist. I'd have you delve into the First Street Foundation website. I have learned to not name names. So in my Climatopolis book, I said Fargo is a climate safe city. And then there was a big flood that year. And so, I, um, and so I, so your question is an important one. But again, what economists are about, and maybe you're going to say we're just useless, is we're about what rules of the game get us a better society. Scientists are about what's the evolution of the physical realities we face. The investors in this room control millions and billions of dollars. I have a young son. Many of you have children. Are you optimistic about this country? The decisions you guys make will determine whether we are on higher ground. Uh, where do we build our physical assets? So uh, Greta Thunberg would say, stop building coal-fired power plants. And, and I agree with her. And the way to stop that is by accelerating the green transition and by taxing carbon, two things that I both support. But the investments you make are going to be long-lived, you're going to be investing in long-lived durable assets. If we build these assets in relatively safer places that First Street Foundation identifies, and if we build them with materials that hold a real option to upgrade them as we learn and as engineering makes progress, then I'm even more optimistic. Phoenix, I, so my wife and I were actually looking for property at Scottsdale. And so, I, and so here's the story where Scottsdale is a good investment. Let it be the case that because of work from home, people can pivot in, privileged people can pivot, pivot in eight months a year. Let it be the case that water markets are used to efficiently allocate the increasingly scarce resource of water. Let air conditioning innovation continue. In that case, a phoenix does thrive in the American West, but there were several assumptions there. And so this, this is how my wife and I are thinking about our own investment decisions. Some of the solutions that you're talking about actually exacerbate climate change. So air, air conditioning is the perfect example. Uh, am I wrong? That would be good. So you're right and wrong. So uh, Alex, could you type into Google uh, Lucas Davis, Paul Gertler, 2015 penis? So uh, Lucas Davis and Paul Gertler are two excellent economists at Berkeley. Uh, penis is P-N-A-S, nothing dirty. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
So these guys wrote a paper set in Mexico that as Mexico becomes a middle class nation, ugly, as Mexico becomes a middle class nation, everyone purchasing an air conditioner, and they studied what are the resulting impacts on greenhouse gas emissions. Because he's correct. So, so contribution of air conditioning adoption to future energy use under global warming. So folks, the bad news is I know everything. It's, um, and so I was the referee on this paper. And again, what these guys do is they make your point, but they're empiricists. They say, Matt, stop the optimism. Mexico is getting richer, and it's getting hotter, and poor people in Mexico are buying an air conditioner. Uh, the use of air conditioning is poised to increase dramatically. These guys measure this, and then they use Mexico's current carbon factor, that Mexico uses a lot of coal-fired power, to have a feedback loop on how much greenhouse gas emissions will go up. But because President Biden and Greta Thunberg are succeeding in decarbonizing the grid, you are going to see nations such as Mexico as they air condition and more air conditioning with a cleaner grid, and there's going to be less of the feedback loop that he correctly points out there currently is. And so the sweet spot is we're going to need to consume more electricity to adapt to climate change. The feedback negative loop on exacerbating climate change is going to be mitigated by this greening of the grid. But he currently is correct. And so I was asked to speak about the synergies between adaptation and mitigation. This is a great example. We are going to have to air condition more. But those owners of real estate in the room shouldn't feel guilty about that, because the carbon footprint associated with this is going down due to Musk, due to batteries, due to wind power and solar power. We're going to need more electricity. Not a question, but first of all, thank you for the book. I, I appreciate it. And it's great to have you here. As, as you can all tell, Matt is a, is a super thoughtful guy who knows just about everything. But I think the point that the gentleman made in the center of the room is, is a troublesome one, right? So we can look back at the Spain made one bad decision. They thought they sort of had it all and, and they blew it, right? We, we had nuclear energy moving very quickly in this country and one very smart green guy killed it effectively. So the hope is that innovation, as innovation avails itself to us, that we make the right choices, right? So there's still on the margin good choices, bad choices, and so just simply, hopefully we make good choices because you're right, we're gonna have, we're gonna have a wide array of good choices, most likely, in front of us. Not a question. <laughs> a libertarian would answer that that shows you a cost of federalism. If you decentralize power to the states and let each of them run their own experiments, we would learn faster as you can watch this, uh, this democracy taking place in each of these markets. So there's interesting trade-offs for investors in this room. Do you want a set of federal rules or would you want a set of local rules and then you can uh, vote with your feet for what set of rules you want to abide by? And so I take Dan's point that, um, that with federal rules, you can end up with one size fits all and we can march off in the wrong direction. But we, this is a global world. Uh, China is making major investments in green technology right now. Folks, how many of you read my 2011 piece of the New York Times, <laughs> How We Gain from China's Advances? That got a lot of angry mail from both the left and the right. And I was trying to anger everyone. I'm always trying to anger people uh, to think. What I was trying to say there is China and other Asian countries have free road on the United States in innovation for decades. Now China is stepping up with its own innovation. And Walmart can purchase cheaper solar panels because of China's efforts and it partially it, it, its industrial policy to subsidize these goods. So I actually think it's terrific if the Communist Party wants to subsidize wind power and solar power. Our conservatives and red state people have cheaper stuff to purchase to, to go green. And the Walmarts of the world are more likely to do so. So that was my piece, How We Gained from China's Advances. And you can see it was very unpopular as I celebrated Chinese dumping. You mentioned desalination. Israel is already doing it. Why isn't the US doing it? Water prices are too low. And so if water prices would rise, the price, the price of water is basically zero. And so, it's, so we got to let prices rise, and then all sorts of investments come into the money. Let prices signal scarcity. Government puts floors on insurance, puts ceilings on insurance, electricity, and water, and makes me sad. So he, here's a follow-up question. 
uh, you made one set of assumptions um, as an economist, and that was that public policy would be economically rational. But voters get in the way. The voters who live in, in the west coast of Florida want their homes rebuilt. The alfalfa farmer wants his farm. Is there a way to build that into your model? And what's going on in the discussion between economists and politicians? I like it. So that's what I was trying to allude to when I was talking about moral hazard. And of course, you're right. We all want to spend other people's money on things we want. And a very interesting issue is we'll be better able to adapt to the very serious challenges we face if we're spending our own money. If you know that you're going to get a bailout, think of San Francisco commercial towers right now and work from home. If you follow me on Twitter, you've known that I've posted some nasty stuff saying, is one reason why commercial towers in San Francisco are being slow to be converted into residential because folks are hoping for a Biden bailout after the next election? And so, I, I'm, so I'm always thinking through how does politics affect the real economy? And we, again, we will be better able to adapt to the challenges we face if people are spending their own money. If you spend someone else's money, you order some very fancy stuff at lunch. I'm just interested in particularly what you're saying about water and how it would apply. So Colorado actually just passed a law on uh, fire resiliency code and building out WUI maps, so urban, wilderness urban interface similar to the flooding maps. I just wonder if you have any comments about whether that's kind of a policy in the right direction or how that's going to impact insurance prices. If those maps are correct, and, and that's what I meant by model uncertainty, so your question's a crucial one. If, if those maps that the state of Colorado is adopting are correlated with the truth, then that directs us to higher ground. It would be horrible if there was a fire and we were at risk and, and I said, hey, everyone, here's safety and, and there's double fire out here. So there's a fascinating question of, of with these climate models, how do we update our beliefs about risk? And it, these maps will help if they're correlated with the truth. But if we are skeptical, and we have to, every model is a model, and we can't take these as the truth. And that's actually a cutting edge issue. So for those of you who know some Bayesian statistics, each of us has a prior. You showed up today thinking this would be a good talk. You now know it wasn't. Uh, and, so, and so there's always a question in life. I flip a coin three times, and it's heads three times. Do you still think it's a fair coin? How do we update our subjective probabilities? This is actually a frontier topic that Chuck Mansky will win the Nobel Prize for in economics. And so your question is a great one, that I support this competition between Jupiter, between FEMA, between First Street Foundation to improve our climate models. But we have to keep in mind that they're models and that, that we're never going to learn the truth because greenhouse gas emissions keep rising, so the risks keep changing. So we're sort of chasing a moving target, which is very frustrating but very important for investors to know. So trust, but verify. In your sort of like free market hy hypothetical world, Hype how do you- Is the right word. <laughs> how do you address issues like tragedy of the commons where individuals optimize their decision behavior, but in aggregate, it is a suboptimal like, so solution? So this is a great one. And I, and I was tweeting about his great question the other day. Folks, Canada is on fire, and Chicago and New York and Minnesota are filled with PM 2.5 smoke. And I have been trying to think through what would a free market person think there? Has President Biden, have we sent any planes and firefighting equipment to Canada to address this regional public bad? And so your question's a very important one because climate risks cross boundaries. And several of you have alluded to this, fire jumping boundaries, particulate matter jumping boundaries, water pollution going down the Danube, the downstream, the Mekong River in Asia, pollution coming down into Vietnam from China. So with regional public beds, there's very difficult issues of coordinating and solving the tragedy of the commons. And I actually want my PhD students working on that. I, it's a very important question. I, some would say if you link free trade, if the US said to Canada, we will have favorable terms on things you're trying to export if you address this cross-boundary externality, that would be the, an example of linkage. Lawyers might say that violates the World Trade Organization. So, so th these issues continue to arise. But your question's a crucial one. What do you think the impact is on rational economic behavior when there's a mis mismatch in the horizon for investments, the decision makers in the room, then the long-term viability of those assets? 
so what I was taught at our vaunted <laughs> University of Chicago and, and uh, is the most patient investor will end up with these assets. So, so if there, well, let's do this two ways. Um, if we all were equally patient, then we would all value some present discounted value stream using the standard formula. If the most patient person in the economy will end up owning everything, you're supposed to laugh. That, that's a prediction of Chicago bottles because she will pay everyone for these assets. She values the asset more than everyone else who's impatient and just wants to be paid for the asset. So can I ask you to ask your question again? So with patient, I would say the following. The most patient investors will have a greater incentive to think through these climate risks because you're going to be holding properties for 30 years. If you're just holding a property for five years and you think you can put lipstick on a pig and sell it to someone else, you're going to pump and dump or whatever these phrases are. Tough room. But if you're buying and holding an asset and you're a patient investor, you have even more of an incentive to do your homework because you're, this is going to be on your books. So this is actually, I debate myself on whether mortgage securitization is a good thing. Should banks, when they make a loan, have to hold it on their own books? Would they do their homework more and talk to more climate resilience experts if they had to hold the loan versus you can just get the loan and sell it to the GSEs? And I wrote a well-known paper on that topic of after natural disasters, banks uh, being more likely to issue conforming loans that they can sell to the GSEs. But again, back to your question. It, investors would be, more, would be more likely to do their homework and be less likely to make bad loans if they knew they were patient and going to hold the asset on their books for a long time. But isn't there some psychological imbalance between the individual making that? Because you have to separate the individual from the institution on the horizon as well. So I naively, and you guys are the experts, I'm just the nerd. I naively thought that the institution had incentivized the investors to play the long-term game. So Kevin Murphy here at Marshall Business School says you should pay um, the CEO of a firm with stock options. Guys, have you read my work that you should pay the mayor of a city with land of the city? You guys really haven't read my work. <laughs> Published 11 books, 150 articles, you've read none of them. <laughs> it's, it's very good for me to know that I'm still nothing. The, um, and I'm on videotape. Uh, so I'm a consistent man. You align the incentives of investors with the long term. Uh, Kevin Murphy's view, of, of you compensate CEOs with stock options. That's how Bezos and Musk got paid. And with mayors, pay them with parcels of land so that they play the long game and not just four years of pumping up the economy and running, leaving a deficit in whatever's left. But your question's a crucial one. We, the, solving the principal agent issue of incentivizing short-term, um, solving the principal agent problem of getting the agent, the investor, to respect the shareholder's objectives is crucial. And you're absolutely right. How do you see governments reacting to the notion of managing scarce water while also taking into account income disparities? So I wrote a piece with Bhaskar at the USC Viterbi where we advocated the following, what we thought was a humane pricing scheme. Everyone needs water, and even I understand this, that if you price gouge on water that poor people will lose the most. We proposed an opt-in scheme for both electricity and water that, that you incentivize large consumers of water and electricity who are likely to be price responsive and to use AI. Chris Cashton will soon be talking about AI in a couple of minutes. Electric utilities and water districts could use AI and their data to identify large residential, industrial, and commercial consumers of water and electricity who, if they face dynamic pricing, would, could sh would sharp pre be predicted to sharply reduce their consumption. That opt-in approach would protect poor people from being price gouged. So a very important point that I didn't make, climate change has its most negative impacts on poor people. Musk, Musk is already planning to leave to Mars. And, and, and Bezos has a very big boat to go somewhere. Uh, a, poor people always face the greatest brunt of shocks. And every a, a humane society and a fair society has to think through how to protect the poor from, from the horrors that we've collectively unleashed. And so my work on thinking about nonlinear water and electricity pricing is trying to reduce aggregate demand for water during droughts and electricity during heat waves while protecting the poor from high prices. And that's an example of how economists are useful. Now, don't it, I mean, we in LA do something a lot. I mean, we have tiered pricing. Yes, but right? not dynamic. 
it's not done, but at least it's basically trying to get You're at right. this. Is You're right. To brush your teeth and boil your tea water, it costs almost nothing in LA. But once you get beyond one threshold, it becomes quite expensive. And then when you get beyond the next, it becomes very, very expensive. I agree. And we've cut our water usage here in Los Angeles by a substantial amount of it. I don't remember the exact number, but I want to say something like 30% in the last 20 years. But what, so you should like, so it shows pricing really works, and there's a way you could do it without harming the poor. I agree. But we keep having these governors asking us to conserve versus picking up their Econ 101 textbook and saying, let's raise the price during times of scarcity. And so with our smartphones, we ha now have the ways, we're so used to facing dynamic pricing on Amazon, on all these different platforms, but government is not allowing certain prices to fluctuate. The stock market adjusts every day, and we don't have people freaking out that the price of Tesla went up 20%. So I'm very interested in which dynamic prices we're comfortable with versus which, like for gasoline, we're not comfortable with. And that's a very interesting behavioral puzzle. We're talking simultaneously about free markets, but then you did talk about the need to do Pigouvian pricing for certain things. How do we set that price? How do we know what the right price is for carbon taxes, for instance? So there is, there's an on, it's an excellent question. Because auctions are operating in a world of uncertainty too. So how do the people participating in these auctions know what the equilibrium price should be. So when Mary Nichols was the head of the Air Resources Board in California, what she did is she set up an auction. She created a vertical supply curve and said California will not emit more than this fixed number of tons. And then the demanders for these tons, electric utilities, cement makers, that led to a demand curve. Folks, everyone give me a supply and demand, show some love to an old professor. And then where the demand curve crossed the supply curve, that was the price. So Richard is right, so that, market mechanism, setting a vertical supply curve, letting demanders reveal themselves, and having an aggregate demand curve that cuts the vertical supply curve, that reveals a price. Richard's right that I don't know the optimal carbon tax. So when you read about the social cost of carbon, so folks, have you seen those words in the media, the social cost of carbon? When you see those words, what the nerds are talking about is what they think is the optimal tax what the tax on gasoline should be, or the tax on coal. Um, a very provocative professor who's moving to Stanford Business School argued that environmentalists should purchase all the world's coal. So if we want, if, if we want to stop climate change, you could either tax the use of coal, or you could purchase all the world's coal and just put it by the side of the road. And so he wrote a paper called Buy Coal. And notice this would cut through the politics. There's a question, what would become of the coal miners? Would you just have these guys pretend to shovel this stuff? And I actually wrote a paper on that, um, which we don't have time to talk about. Uh, uh, but I thought it was a brilliant idea of his. Who has the property rights to pollute? So much of the red state, blue state debate is not over climate change, as our Redfin paper shows. It's over property rights. If you live in suburban Houston and you like your Hummer, you like your meat barbecue, you work at Exxon, do you have the right to that lifestyle? Or, or, or is Greta Thunberg going to make you pay for that lifestyle? We're having a fight over property rights. Um, if you like my shoes, you can't take them from me. You have to buy them from me. Of sort, what do we own? And so Bart Harstad of Stanford argued, okay, you want to stop this climate change challenge? This is an existential threat? Then purchase all the world's coal. And instead, we continue to litigate over this in a democratic setting rather than just declaring if this is an existential th threat that you're very worried about, put your money where your mouth is and buy the coal. It's a thought experiment. I don't want to endorse it, but it shows you how economists are always having fun and always thinking, and he got a job at Stanford with that paper. Matt, Matt. Instead, though, they're doing the exact opposite. Like, everyone is defunding, divesting of all these. And, and what are the implications of, of that? So they're... So I'm actually right. I think this is a good place to stop of, of answering Matt's question. Um, we are writing a paper right now where we're studying CalPERS and other public pension funds investment in Exxon and other companies. And I know that there's some experts from public pension funds in the room. And what we're studying is our belief, and we're seeing that this in the data, that the larger the share of public pension fund, blue public pension funds in fossil fuel companies, the more they reduce their emissions. 
So if you want Exxon and other companies to reduce their emissions, you, you want the, the blue folks with a seat at the table versus divesting and running away, which I think is what you just said. And so this is a new paper that John Matsusaka of Marshall, Chung Sung, and I are writing. Again, this is, this, you're raising an important point about carbon mitigation. Today was not about Greta. I see you want to get rid of me. But we're studying, if business wants to green capitalism, what we're finding in our paper is that environmentalists, the business environmentalist community does need to be at the table. And, and so and we're showing that in our work. So folks, don't walk away saying Khan said we don't need to reduce our emissions because we can adapt. I'm optimistic about our future because we're going to reduce our emissions and we're going to adapt. These two are like left shoe, right shoe. Matt, thank you so much. <laughs>